Hi, my name is Bernice Dagwell, welcoming you back to another episode of Montclair News Lab. Extreme weather events are happening harder and faster here in New Jersey. We'll take a look at why. Anticipating death. Then, a behind-the-scenes look at an exciting collaboration between Montclair State University and ESPN. I received an email from the director of the Kelly School of Music. Later, POV, where students share their favorite spots on campus. Welcome to Studio B. Your school, your news. All this and more on Montclair News Lab. First up, the effects of climate change here in the Garden State. Storms are fiercer, summers are hotter. We start with a special report produced by Carter Winter. Severe storms have always taken place, but in the last few years, they have been hitting the coastal state of New Jersey hard. I've lived in South Jersey all my life. Melody Randall is used to storms in town, so the tornado warning on her children's first day of school seemed like any other. We kind of equated it to a normal storm warning. The family went about preparing dinner. Around four o'clock, five o'clock warnings started to come across the screen, tornado warnings for the area, which we don't get that often. My son looked out the window about five o'clock and he saw that the clouds were getting darker and more intense. Around 6 p.m., an hour after the warning, Melody looked outside. So I told my husband, look, that looks, you know, like there's a, a partial um, roof kind of flying around in a circle. He immediately said, uh, that's a tornado, everyone get in the basement. The family rushed to safety and for 45 seconds, they piled on top of each other in the basement. It got really quiet. Uh, we didn't hear anything. So then we proceeded to um, walk up the steps and when we walked up the steps, we saw our entire home had been destroyed. The, one of the first things that I noticed is that my vehicle that was actually parked in the driveway was on the roof. Our entire front of the house was in the backyard. There was abso absolutely no wall in our family room where we had been gathered prior to the storm. Melody's family had lived in that home for 15 years. It was our um, a, a home that we built from the ground. Uh, all of our belongings were in a shamble um, and the whole neighborhood essentially was destroyed. The family lost nearly everything in the storm. It was very difficult to see that everything that you've worked for all your life was kind of destroyed. I would never predict that in New Jersey we would have a storm to this caliber. Coastal storms in New Jersey are common, but in recent years, the severity and frequency of these storms has spiked. And I do believe is related to climate change. New Jersey's had an unusual number of tornadoes this year. Dr. Greg Pope is a professor at Montclair State University. He believes, like Melody, that climate change can impact the severity of storms. Trends of those kind of weather events, like more hurricanes or more intense hurricanes, more of them over time, those are considered legitimate signals that the climate is changing. Dr. Pope says that global warming is a sign of climate change. You know, Hurricane Ida gained more power, more kind of energy, fueling off warmer ocean water, which could be a product of global warming. The impact of severe hurricanes and flooding was felt closely by Little Falls resident Bradley Demo. Demo has experienced two major flooding incidents in three years. There's multiple homes in this neighborhood that have been destroyed, foundations and all, basement completely flooded um, twice in the last three years now. Demo was out of state during the first flood in 2018 when he received a call from the Little Falls Police Department. My vehicle at the time was either missing, flooded, gone. The water level was well above the engine, so it completely totaled it, fried the electrical system. The 2018 storm was devastating, but Ida made it look like child's play. Ida gave us a lot more water in the street than the last one, and. Uh, certainly a lot longer lasting. Pope and Demo attribute some of the flooding to aging infrastructure. It's particularly vulnerable because it is now no longer resistant to certain kinds of you know, extreme flooding that it might have been earlier when those types of floods weren't as common. After the first event in 2018, uh, there was some proposals to install flood levees and flood walls along the Peckman uh, River, which was the one that flooded that time. I know not much has been done in regards to that. Locals felt hopeful at the idea of flood protection for future storms, but after Ida hit and no progress was made, fear for their safety lingered. Our government, in theory, by its you know nature, is meant to help and protect the people. Now that the new infrastructure law is going into effect and billions are flowing to large organizations, Dr. Pope says that people need to put pressure on the government. They're much as much on the hook for changing the way they do things. Uh, that can make more of a dent than collectively you and me. For residents like Melody Randall and Bradley Demo, this 
is a matter of survival. At one point during a tornado, my eyes were fixed open, um, anticipating death. It's a real concern. If anyone had any um, doubt about the effects of climate change, I would tell them to start to evaluate situations like we experienced in New Jersey. One state, two regions, and countless communities facing the devastating effects of climate change. And now we speak to Montclair State Professor of Earth and Environmental Studies, Dr. Ying Su, to talk about how climate change affects our everyday lives. There will be a more frequent occurrence of hurricanes in coastal cities. Uh, so we've already seen some uh, recent hurricanes happening, right? Hurricane Ida, a lot of people's basement got flooded, including mine. I wasn't expecting <laughs> it to be flooded. Uh, it was in a higher elevated uh, uh, area, and it wasn't uh, a flood zone. <laughs> but uh, my concern is that uh, more and more these areas are going to be um, characterized into flat zones. So this is what happened in East Coast. Uh, if we're looking into the West Coast in California, which you know, we might have too little rain, right? We have too much rain here in New Jersey, but uh, there's too little rain in, out to the, to the west uh, uh, where there is wildfire, right? There's drought going on for months. So I've always taught my students the best way of uh, reducing your uh, carbon footprint, uh, the first thing to do is to reduce. There is going to be more frequent hurricanes occurring, uh, and which bring a lot of rainfall uh, and wind into the coastal towns. In terms of ocean acidification, it's definitely going to affect the fisheries. Primary producers in the food chain is going to be disrupted. And then it's going to further impact uh, the, uh, the consumers in the next level in the food chain and therefore impact the ocean ecosystem. And uh, the end permian mass extinction event, uh, also known as the mother of all extinction that happened about 252 million years ago, where about 80 to 90 percent of the marine species died because of uh, what we think uh, uh, is an ocean acidification event. Uh, so we think we can use these ancient events to help us better understand the consequences of ocean acidification as we're pumping the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we hope to preserve that biodiversity in our modern ocean. And so one way is to slow down the emission of carbon dioxide uh, rather than reaching the rate uh, of what happened 252 million years ago where 90% of these marine species all died off at once. So there's huge uncertainties about uh, uh, how the climate is going to change in the future in response to these human activities. We are only one week away from our big Focus Disruption kickoff event. It's on Wednesday, November 17th at 3 p.m. on all our Montclair State media platforms. We sat down with senior producer Julia Egan and asked her what it was like to put the show together. Can you just tell me all about FOCUS? So FOCUS is a collaboration between all of the organizations in the School of Communications. So the News Lab is involved, the Montclairian, WMSC, Red Hawk Sports Network, everybody's involved. What specifically is FOCUS Disruption? So focus disruption is discussing how COVID affected our lives within the past year, but more importantly, we're focusing on how it's going to affect our future. And we are focusing on five subcategories. So those five subcategories are mental health, misinformation, education, the workforce, and climate change. We'll be hitting all of those topics and talking about how we were affected during COVID and how these categories will continue to be affected. Why should college students specifically tune into Focus Disruption? I think you should tune in because even if you don't think your life was disrupted, it is. And parts of your day-to-day -day life are changing. And through the show, you'll be able to learn how are these things continuing to change. Focus Disruption is a collaboration between all the student media organizations in the School of Communication and Media. Catch the Focus Disruption kickoff show on all digital platforms on November 17th. Recently, ESPN staged a huge production at Caster Theater here on campus. Red Hawk Sports Network's Jess Lipson has the report. Monday Night Football is an iconic TV production. This has been going on for 50 years. One of the most recognizable things about the production is its soundtrack. Recently, Montclair State had some visitors as ESPN shot their Monday Night Football teaser. The production will be the opening to the Steelers and Bears matchup. 
ESPN director Rico Labe explains his concept using live music for a new spin on the classic theme song. This is a old versus new kind of thing, right? So one part of it is nostalgic. Second part of it is looking forward in this season. So for this production, uh, we have four cameras, and when shooting an orchestra, it usually you're limited on time, so you want to make sure that you can cover many spots and have a variety of lenses, and we have a drone, we've got a dolly. You want to make sure that everything's not just stationary and you put some movement in it to give it energy. Thanks to a university connection, ESPN rented out the Alexander Kasser Theater on campus for their production. After seeing a performance by the school orchestra online, the producers decided to use them and conductor Nicholas de Maison to bring the theme to life. I received an email from the director of the Kelly School of Music, Tony Mizaki, and I was a little shocked that uh, we, would, we would make such a crossover kind of event, um, but thrilled that the students would have this kind of opportunity. We saw them online and we saw them play. We, we were like, wow, this is a great orchestra. And the orchestra matches the theater. From that standpoint, we saw it in the pictures. We said, oh yeah, this is the place we have to be. When asked how to be successful in any media industry, Labe narrowed it down to one keyword. Perseverance. You've got to persevere. It's kind of like sports, right? There's a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of inconsistencies. But as long as you stay consistent and you believe in what you're doing and you believe in the trade, whatever the trade is that you pick, good things will happen. I am tremendously proud of the students in the orchestra for all the work that they do on a regular basis to perform at the level at which they do. A tradition any university would be proud to be a part of. For Montclair News Lab, this is Jess Lipson. After being shut down for nearly two years, Montclair State University galleries reopened to the public. Up next, we have a report by Keyshawn Reese, produced by News Lab's Katie Lawrence. Taking a famous historical piece and recreating it for the digital age is not an easy task. Transmedia artist Carla Gannis did just that with Hieronymus Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights. She put her own twist on Bosch's piece that is driven by his view on paradise, earth, and hell using emoji. Her reimagination is titled The Garden of Emoji Delights. So if we watch this, it's a, actually a 4K video, but I want it to loop like an animated GIF you see on the internet. One other thing I'll say is I did create and produce quite a few of my own emoji to emulate the original Bosch painting. The exhibit Tech No Future From Slang to Structure is centered around technology in today's climate. Art curator for the exhibit, Tom Leeser, wants visitors to explore the questions the art suggests. When people visit the gallery and when they, when they see the work, I want them to experience the work in ways that allow them to enter into dialogue with the work. Director of University Galleries Megan Austin hopes the art grabs the eye of patrons. I think the most appealing thing for a visitor is when they walk by something and they think, what is that? Our job as a, as a gallery is to facilitate opportunities for people to question what conclusions they come to about art, about themselves, about community, and, and about the world. An artist, a director, and a curator cultivating a new future for art and technology. For Montclair News Lab, I'm Keyshawn Reese. POV, or Point of View, is the segment we're bringing back from last semester. Now, News Lab reporter Solana Broll shows us where she gets to call the shots on campus. Hello everyone, my name is Solana Broll and welcome to Studio B, my favorite spot on campus. Before committing to the television and digital media major, I would always pass by Studio B and see the students working in the control room through the window. I was always drawn to the fun and chaos that comes with television production. This right here is the technical director position, also known as TD, and probably my favorite position in the control room. I know it looks scary because of all the buttons and stuff, but once you get the hang of it, it's actually really fun. Now that I'm finally in the major, it feels amazing to be able to sit down in the control room chairs and surround myself with other creatives. I have done lots of laughing, learning, and even crying in this room, but I think of it all as a process that will better me for my career. I'm Solana Broll, and this has been my campus POV. That's all for this episode of Montclair News Lab. I'm Bernice Segwa. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you again next week for a brand new episode. Stay safe out there.